read all my comics and I want to go out and buy And I look at the rack and I cannot decide Will I get R.I.P. or Nightwing's Last Dance? Yeah! There's a podcast to get you straight, you Jerry and Chris will never betray you He's straight no matter the price is Get more games or identity crisis Look out, bad books for beginners Bad books for beginners Bad books for beginners Welcome to Bad Books for Beginners It's a little old place where we can talk some Batman Sit back, get comfortable Take your relaxant of choice and enjoy the trip. A uh, ride. <laughs> you know. Welcome to Bat Books for Beginners. Here are Jerry and Chris. Bat Books for Beginners. Bat Books for Beginners. Bat Books for Beginners. Hello, and welcome to this edition of TBU's Bat Books for Beginners, episode 168. My name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts. On Bat Books for Beginners, we will examine story arcs with Batman and related characters. We'll give you the historical background of the book, break down the plot and the art, and give you our opinions so you can decide for yourself if they're worth a read. Today's Bat Book is Under the Red Hood. Chris, tell us a little bit about this book. Thank you very much, Jerry. Hello, Bat fans. Thank you for downloading this episode and spending some of your time with us today. Batman Under the Red Hood is a massive 384-page trade paperback that was cover dated August 2011 and had a cover price of $29.99. I'll note right here, and I think this is important for anyone who is considering getting the hard copy version of this, is to be careful. When this material was originally reprinted in 2006... It was collected in two separate volumes or parts, each with a $9.99 cover price. So, if you see Batman Under the Red Hood priced at a significant discount from a used bookstore or online vendor, make sure of what is being offered, a part of the story or the entire collected work. According to MyComicShop.com, all volumes have gone through first and subsequent printings. Online vendors do appear to have this on sale for less than cover price, and this trade paperback does appear to be available on Comixology. Now, sometimes I'll mention if there is a scenario where you'd be better off getting the individual issues from a cost standpoint. That would not be the case here. The opening issue alone, Batman number 635, is a collector's item, with prices of a very good copy ranging anywhere from $60 to $100 alone from online vendors for the individual issue. Batman Under the Red Hood collects Batman numbers 635 through 641 and numbers 645 to number 650 and Batman Annual number 25. The individual regular issues were cover dated from February 2005 through April 2006. Now, if you listen carefully just a moment ago, you'll note that there is a gap in the issue numbers. What happened there? One issue, number 642, was a Killer Croc Mad Hatter story. Numbers 643 and 644 dealt with the war crimes story arc, and that's something that Jerry and I covered in a previous episode of this podcast. Back then, the individual cover price of an issue started at $2.25, but with issue of Batman number 641, the cover price took a quarter bump, jumping from $2.25 to $2.50. Now, I want to note that I really think the covers to the individual issues were outstanding. The artwork was great. Matt Wagner did the cover artwork for the first half of the volume, and Jock did the artwork for the latter half. Okay, so speaking of the artwork, let's get to our creative teams, which I'll cover the backgrounds on from memory, and I'm going from some online sources. Doug Mankey did the majority of pencils for this story. I don't believe Doug Mankey was mentioned on a previous podcast yet. He's 62 years old right now and a native of St. Paul, Minnesota. 
I think it might be fair to say he first got his notice when he worked on the Mask title for Dark Horse Comics, as well as a title called X, which was inked by Jimmy Palmiotti. He also worked on Green Lantern, Justice League, Superman, the Man of Steel, a short-lived title called Major Bummer. The one, <laughs> yeah, and that was a humor title if you couldn't figure that out. And uh, one-shot Batman, the Man Who Laughs, how appropriate, and contributed art to The Final Crisis written by Grant Morrison. I couldn't find much background on Paul Lee, who penciled an issue. That was the one where Superman appeared, and I thought he did a really good job. Tom Quinn did the inking chores. Shane Davis did the pencil on issues Batman 646 and Batman Annual 25. Again, he's another fine artist, but one I found little background of. And a handful of various credits from the mid-2000s, but nothing recently. Judd Winnick is our writer. Now, he's been mentioned on our podcast before. I think I first encountered his work on the Green Arrow title. And I'm going to cheat here. According to Amazon via Wikipedia, Winnick first gained fame for his 1994 stint on MTV's The Real World San Francisco before earning success for his comic book work on Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and Pedro and Me. His autobiographical graphic novel about his friendship with real world castmate and AIDS educator Pedro Zamora. He created the animated TV series The Life and Times of Juniper Lee, which ran on Cartoon Network for three seasons. Batman Under the Red Hood was also adapted into a 75 minute PG 13 animated movie that was released in 2010. The vocal talent in the cast included Bruce Greenwood as Batman, Neil Patrick Harris as Nightwing, Jensen Eccles as Red Hood, John DiMaggio as Joker, Wade Williams as Black Mask, Jason Isaacs as Ra's al Ghul, and Jim Paddock as Alfred Pennyworth. It has a 8.1 rating out of 10 on IMDb. Over on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a rating of 100%. But, but mind you, that's only with seven critic scores. But the audience score is at 92%, with an average rating of 4.2 out of 5. So overall, very, very favorable ratings for this DVD release. I rewatched it again before recording our segment, and while there are some slight differences, I found a lot of the dialogue very faithful to the comic book. Which isn't surprising, as Judd Winnick wrote the screen adaptation. The animation was very good, and not quite in the typical house style that I don't care for, which was used in a string of DC Direct DVD, uh, Direct DVD movies. I did like the animated adaptation of this story, but it did leave a story element out that I like from the comic, ver- comic book version. More on this later when we get to our overall comments. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Jerry. Thanks, Chris. So we're going to talk about this story after a few messages from our friends. When you talk about comics, does it sound something like this? Look, you can't put the Superman number 77s with the 200s. They haven't even discovered Red Kryptonite yet. And you, uh, you can't put the number 98 with the 300s. Lori the Morris hasn't even been introduced. Or maybe it sounds a little more like this. You think Mighty Mouse could beat up Superman? What are you, cracked? Why not? I saw the other day he was carrying five elephants in one hand. Boy, you don't know nothing. Mighty Mouse is a cartoon. Superman is a real guy. No way a cartoon could beat up a real guy. Yeah, maybe you're right. It would be a good fight, though. Hello, I am the constantly caffeinated Clinton Robison, and my comics discussions can go to both extremes, but generally fall somewhere in between. On the Coffee and Comics podcast, I will review comic stories and other comics-related topics that can be enjoyed over a cup of coffee. So pour the coffee, or other beverage of choice, and join me on the Coffee and Comics podcast, available on iTunes and coffeeandcomicspodcast.blogspot.com. Welcome back. So now here is the story of Under the Red Hood. Batman is fighting an unusually well-prepared opponent who's wearing a red hood. The pair fight back and forth, each getting a temporary advantage and then being fought off by the other. Bruce's cowl gets removed and in the fighting, and his opponent thinks that it's only fair if he removes his head covering too. Bruce sees his face and is astonished by the man's identity. Who could he be? Flashback to five weeks earlier. Lucius Fox informed Bruce that a small German holding company has bought out controlling stock in Cord Corporation, the organization that Bruce gets all of his bat tech from. Elsewhere, a meeting of Gotham crime leaders is going on. 
it's interrupted by the Red Hood, who convinces them to be members of his criminal organization, thanks to a duffel bag full of severed heads of the gang members. Black Mask, the leader of all crime in Gotham City, isn't concerned with Red Hood's activities, but does recruit Mr. Freeze for some special consulting work. Freeze has a habit of killing Black Mask's men, though, and he doesn't really re- seem to respect the hierarchy of the organization. However, Black Mask will use him when he needs him. Batman and Nightwing disrupt an arms deal at the Gotham Dock. One crate is booby-trapped, and the pair escapes the exploding ship just in time. Batman sees that they are being watched by a figure on a nearby rooftop. As the two chase the red-hooded observer, Batman recognizes something about the way the man moves. They follow Red Hood into a warehouse where they come face to face with Amazo, a gigantic android that was designed to defeat the whole Justice League. The two are able to defeat the robot. Black Mask is upset that his shipment of arms has been destroyed. There was something special in the shipment. A a call comes in from, you guessed it, Red Hood, saying that he has something that Black Mask might want, a hundred pounds of kryptonite. The two come to an agreement on the sale of the rocks, and Black Mask sends Mr. Freeze to kill Red Hood and get the kryptonite. Batman and Nightwing have detected the traces of Kryptonian radiation and realizes that there's a large cache of kryptonite at large in Gotham that needs to get tracked down. Mr. Freeze shows up to an abandoned warehouse to get the kryptonite. Negotiations go pear-shaped, and he and Red Hood get into a shooting match. Batman and Nightwing arrive and stop the fighting, but the two baddies get away. Although he's leaving empty-handed, Red Hood says that he got what he really came for, the lay of the land. Red Hood goes to an abandoned carnival where he finds an exhausted and burned-out Joker. Red Hood savagely beats Joker with a crowbar. After the clown is well beaten, Red Hood removes his mask to reveal who it is. Jason Todd. Could it be? Batman suspects that Red Hood is Jason Todd because of the way he moved. But how did he come back to life? Batman visits several occult experts from the Dark Universe. He visits Green Arrow and Superman, who were also resurrected in the past, but he gets no further information. Red Hood continues to disrupt Black Mask's business. This is frustrating Black Mask. Onyx is also harassing local criminals as an agent for Batman. She is stalking out some low-level drug dealers when Red Hood arrives. Red Hood says that these guys are selling drugs to 12-year-olds and goes to kick their butts. Onyx joins him. They are about to be overwhelmed by the crooks when Red Hood pulls out a huge gun and mows down the charging dealers. Onyx tries to stop his murderous attack, but Red Hood stabs her through the shoulder with a knife, and she is stuck to the wooden crate behind her. He pulls out the knife and dresses her wound. Before he can beat her up, he is interrupted by Batman. Red Hood and Batman chase each other through Gotham. They run, punch, shoot, explode, trap, trip, and tase each other as they go. Batman gets his cowl removed, and Red Hood removes his as well. Jason Todd confronts Bruce Wayne, his old mentor. Jason gives him his fingerprints and some blood so he can prove that he is in fact Jason. Jason is not angry that Batman let Joker kill him. He is angry that Batman didn't kill Joker in retribution. He believes that Bruce's morality gets in the way of what really needs to be done to fight Gotham crime. Jason gets away and Bruce heads to the Batcave to test Jason's blood and fingerprints. Red Hood is in fact Jason Todd. But how? Bruce removes Jason's casket from his grave and brings it to the Batcave for analysis. Bruce finds that it's the same coffin that was buried, but there had never been a body in it. Red Hood is wreaking havoc on Black Mask's crime business, and not even Batman is able to stop him. Black Mask is furious and wants Red Hood dead. He realizes that Batman is helpless against the onslaught. Black Mask looks looks out the window of his office and sees Red Hood shoot a rocket launcher into it. Black Mask is able to survive and says that whatever it takes, he wants Red Hood dead. This is overheard by none other than Deadshot. Deadshot tells Black Mask that if he joins the Society, a team of costume villains for hire, then the Society will take care of the Red Hood. Black Mask agrees to swear allegiance to the Society, and so they send Captain Nazi and Hyena to kill Red Hood. The two villains find Jason and they fight. 
Batman arrives on the scene and Trank Hyena so she falls asleep. Together, the old master and protege fight and defeat Captain Nazi. Before they can finish him off, they come under psychic attack by another uh, a member of the society, Count Vertigo. Batman has anti-Count Vertigo devices, luckily, in his cowl and gets Red Hood to inject Hyena with adrenaline. Batman grabs a piece of Vertigo's clothing and puts his scent in front of Hyena as she awakes in a speed-rushed frenzy. Vertigo is mauled by Hyena. Captain Nazi grabs Red Hood, who tases him in the eyes and kills him. Bruce is angry with Jason for, for this death. It was unnecessary. The criminal element knows that what is most fearsome about Batman is his resolve to assert his moral code, not his pension for violence. Black Mask gets all his lieutenants together. He kills them all. He has made a deal with the Red Hood to get his obedience. Killing his team is one of the requirements of the deal. However, Red Hood has no intention of submitting to Black Mask, and the two fight in a pool hall. Jason has sent a package to Bruce at Stately Wayne Manor. Inside the box is a strand of green hair. They know that Jason has Joker. There's an address in the package, and Batman goes to it. Batman arrives on the scene of the fight between Black Mask and Red Hood, but as Batman arrives in the pool hall, he sees that Red Hood is lying on the ground with a knife in his chest. Black Mask removes the Red Hood's hood, and it isn't Jason, but a mustachioed older gentleman. Batman knocks the Red Hood out of Black Mask's hand, and it explodes. Black Mask realizes that Red Hood is someone from the Bat family that is stepping out of bounds, and Batman is having trouble stopping him. Jason has the Joker tied to a chair. Joker asks why he doesn't kill him. Could he be weak, just like Batman? Jason uses a knife through the shoulder to pin him to the wall behind. Jason tells Joker that he might be crazy, but Joker isn't nearly as crazy as he pretends to be. That's just a cover for his sick actions. This shuts Joker up, which satisfies Jason. Batman and Jason meet in Crime Alley, where Batman's journey first began and where the two first met. The building Joker is in is wired to explode if Jason clicks a button. The two argue that they see that the society has dropped Chemo, the living bomb, into Bloodhaven. The city explodes in a green flash. Bruce is worried about Dick, who is patrolling Bloodhaven as Nightwing. Bruce wants to go to Bloodhaven to look for Dick, but Jason says that if he leaves, he will kill Joker. Batman and Jason fight. They know each other well, but Batman is able to get Jason to the ground. Jason pulls a gun on his former mentor. He says that he forgives Bruce for letting Joker kill him, but not for leaving the Joker alive afterwards. Bruce says that he's always wanted to kill Joker, but knows that it would be the easy way out and wouldn't solve anything. Jason slides a gun to Bruce and gets Joker in a headlock from behind. If Batman doesn't shoot him, he will kill Joker. Batman hits him in the throat with a batarang. Joker gets the dropped handgun and shoots into the chemicals, causing the building to explode. We learn how Jason came back to life. Superman caused a temporal anomaly when he broke out of prison. This anomaly combined the timeline when Jason was killed with the timeline he died in. This brought him back to life in his coffin in this continuity. Jason was able to claw his way out of the coffin to the air. He is found, but brought to the hospital suffering from a coma. Before he went unconscious, he asked for his father, Bruce. The hospital was unable to identify this Bruce. Jason emerged from his coma and escaped the hospital out into the streets of Gotham. He lived homeless by his wits for over a year. He found when confronted by an aggressive person that he had fantastic fighting skills. He started taking out some of Batman and Robin's old enemies, and the criminal underworld realizes that this Robin is back. News that Jason Todd is alive gets to Talia al Ghul, and Jason is taken to her. He has no memories of before he was killed, however, and doesn't talk. He doesn't really seem to be alert and alive. Talia trains Jason for a year. Ras al Ghul dismisses Jason as useless and is about to rejuvenate himself in the Lazarus pit when Talia pushes Jason into it. Jason gets the rejuvenation of the pit and gets his memories back. He and Talia escape the angry demon's head. Talia tells him that his death is unavenged and pushes him into the sea. Jason makes his way to Gotham, anxious to settle the score from his death. The End 
So that's the story. And Chris and I will talk about our opinions of it after these messages from our friends. Xenozoic Xenophiles. A fan podcast devoted to the comic series Xenozoic Tales. It's a post apocalyptic adventure series filled with Cadillacs and dinosaurs. I'm Ruth. And I'm Darren. We hope you'll join us as we discuss the stories, characters, and art in this excellent comic series from creator, writer, and artist Mark Schultz. Xenozoic Xenophiles is available at podbean.com and on iTunes and Stitcher. And find us at xenozoicxenophiles.com. Welcome back. Chris, what did you think about Under the Red Hood? Well, Jerry, I'll get the negatives and quibbles I had right out of the way out of the gate, because overall, I did like this story. First, I didn't like the opening. This was sort of a few pages where we had the narrative, Gotham City is a hard city, and it makes its people hard. They've seen terrible things, and this is their they live this hardened life. But one of these unusual sites that they never see before is that ellipses and then we move on to the story narrative yeah. and boy I, I am just so tired and over how hard and rough gotham city is mm-hmm. that said we talked a little before we recorded what our initial thoughts were i thought this was a long story and could have been short and you on the other hand thought this was a real quick read for you so i think we can get into that later this before i forget this is also in my opinion a very violent comic book this is not something for young children i wouldn't give this to somebody who is a single digit of age maybe 10 or older for that but there was quite a bit to like here as far as the black mask being a villain i think this was one of his bigger opuses this really made me appreciate the character much much more than any of the previous material that we've covered a favorite scene i had was jason giving batman this ultimatum and choice kill the joker why haven't you done it already and we really got into the comp- complexity of the issue and this was really 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 great stuff i thought overall how about you yeah well i i did some for some reason i thought this was a fast read it's not really the kind of thing that i typically would like it's a lot more you know pretty straight action there's a little bit of detective uh work in here uh but i just felt like this was a page turner i just kept going i'm a I'm a I'm a Robin fan in general. I like uh, definitely Robin stories. I like although Jason's not my favorite Robin. I like him very much, and it was I found it interesting the conflict with him being upset, not of uh, that Batman uh, didn't save him, but he didn't take revenge on the Joker for his death. It you know made him feel like you know does Batman really you know care for me as much as uh, you know I thought he did or whatever. You know it's just. Uh, I, I found it was compelling, and for some reason, I just thought that these fight scenes were good. And I think part of that is because Jason has kind of a smart mouth, and I find it funny. And you, you touched on this too, Black Mask here. He's really, really entertaining in this story. And I think that I, I in the past, you know, we've, we've gone through on the show, we've done some Black Mask. Uh, um, stories, and I've read a lot of Black Mask in the past, and I've never been a particularly big fan of his, one way or the other, but I really, really liked uh, him here. He's so snarky and so uh, so aggressive and just as gleefully violent. I thought that was a, a really good take on the character. Are you a, a Black Mask fan? I'm coming to be more one now based on the material that we've seen here. This gave us some sharp wit, this was almost cinematic in, in scope with the way the story was told. We had some great little one-liners <laughs> after a very violent scene, which was good. Jerry, one thing you touched on, and I didn't want to gloss over it, was one thing you mentioned was the fight scenes. We had some great, great fight scenes here. Yeah. Do you think this was, you know, this was almost, to me, Jason exhibited fight skills that was almost a death stroke quality where he was yeah. really enhanced. Do you think this was fair? Do you think his fight skills were elevated t- t- almost too high as, as they, or caliber as a fighter as they should have been depicted here? 
I, I think that it, that's an interesting question because, you know, at one point he's taken on both Batman and Nightwing and seems to be able to get the upper hand on them, which is not what we, not what I would ex- have expected. Now, he's done some additional training with Talia, I guess. Maybe that is partially to, uh, you know, explains this, but I, I found that that was odd as well. They, they did touch on, uh, Dick's, uh, kind of lingering wound from war games. I wonder if that's another small explanation for why this is possible, but I think that is a little odd. Mm-hmm. Do you think the story was possibly maybe too violent for a child? Do you agree with me on my assessment there? I, I don't know. I just want somebody else's yeah. spin on this if this was just a little, little moment. Much a hundred percent. Perhaps we, we have two okay. people that are impaled by knives through their shoulder into the you know the board or the wall behind them. I think I think that's pretty vivid, and and I don't think a young a young kid this would be this would not be a good story for. I totally agree with you on that, Jerry. You know we talked a little bit before the show. Um, one thing you did mention that we had some great encounters here. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a Superman Batman encounter that was always fun. Right. I think the scene that really resonated to me was the one he had with both Jason Blood and Green Arrow there. And I wanted to mention this to the audience because these elements of the story were not included in the DVD version. While I liked the DVD quite a bit, and it was fast-paced, and it incorporated a lot of the story elements almost word for word in scenes, this was a story element that was left off of the DVD, and I thought that was kind of a shame. Did you like any encounter that Batman had when he visited Superman, Jason Blood, and Green Arrow more than another, or did they all sort of resonate with you in the same way? Uh, to tell you the truth, it, it was very similar. They all resonated me with me in the same way, and it's mostly because that is kind of the detective portion of the story, which right. is he's trying to figure out how did Jason come back to life, and he's going to see other people that have been... Um, um, you know, resurrected in the past. There is a little, uh, a little point in here where Batman realizes that Green Arrow is hiding something from him. And I thought that was a little interesting. I'm not exactly sure where in continuity we are relative to, to Green Arrow, but, uh, I thought that that was for, for people that have been, you know, DC fans that are, have been probably reading multiple, uh, multiple uh, books in the DC universe at this time, that probably was a good tie-in to what was going on. But I just felt, in general, it kind of turned into it. While, while seeing those different characters was interesting, it kind of turned into a dead end from a, from a story standpoint. It doesn't actually come away with any good information. Mm-hmm. And, yep. Uh, yeah, so do, are you familiar with uh, what's going on with Green Arrow at this point? I would have to do my deep dive Green Arrow history. There was an incident where I think his arm got stuck in an airplane and a bomb went off and he, he lost his life. And then he somehow got resurrected. And that was, a, I think, just a couple of years prior to when this initially came out in the initial 2000s. Okay. And what with reading the current Green Arrow stuff now, which is almost so far removed with, with Rebirth as to the material, this is this is one thing that does trouble me, you know, when we do examine trade paperbacks of this period, because a lot of story elements are almost moot at this point, and uh, that troubles me. We had an issue with Cassandra in a previous podcast where we had a question, and, and something always seems to come up whenever we look at material it's in the true. mid-2000s, because it was DC Comics was such a different time back then. And I, I tell you, I don't know if it's an age thing where I tend to... Things are more ingrained that I read in the 70s and 80s versus, say, something from the mid-2000s. I think if, if somebody was perhaps a little younger, that was right in, maybe in their wheelhouse. And I don't want to age myself, but uh, I, I guess I need to uh, retain a little more information and play some memory games as I'm going along with this. Now, now one, one, thing, one yeah. thing that is interesting here, it's, it, this is a pretty decent Bat Family story. Uh, you know, with, with Jason, you know, talking back to the history of, uh, you know, what happened to him and with, uh, with Dick there. Uh, you know, I thought this was, I, I always like a good Bat Family story and this, this had a couple of good characters that I like very much in that. Right. I really like how Jason sort of evolved and I don't know if it went along with the whims of fandom at the time, sort of swaying 
how this character got uh, reshaped over over time because when we first had Jason Todd way back I want to say it was uh, 1983 perhaps it was around Batman uh, Detective excuse me Detective comes from our 526. We introduced with the Todd family. They were originally a family of circle aerialists. Uh, they were the parents were killed by a killer croc, and Jason wore sort of this uh, acrobatic Robin costume, which was similar to a circus acrobat. Then it was reshaped into a Robin costume. We did have a few brief stories with the Bar Davis run with the Jason Robin, but then all of a sudden that sort of immediately got, got retconned. And then that sort of evolved, and then we had the events where he was killed off, the death in the family storyline. Then we had the Hush storyline where he appeared in the grave, and we initially thought, well, it could have been Tavis, or it could have really been Jason resurrected. And, boy, fandom really blew up with speculation that <laughs> Jason it was brought back. One thing you brought up before uh, one of your story points, well, you know, Jerry, Jerry and I talked a little bit before we record these things, was, you know, the Red Hood and how that was adopted yeah. to the identity. And of all things that was chosen and the ties to the Joker, that was really carefully executed, in my opinion. Because the Red Hood has sort of always been this figure, mysterious figure. Now, granted, it's initially tied with the Joker, but if you look in Batman lore and different segments and do some deep dives there, there have always been different characters who've more or less kind of went into this identity or used, quote, the Red Hood as some type of a mysterious trope in Batman's uh, storyline. You can even look at it in uh, the Gotham TV series. That's right. As well as it appears in there. So, yeah, I think this was really well done, and I can really see why Jason, as the Red Hood, has a really good, strong fan following. And this, is, uh, I think, it has a lot of its roots tied to the story right here. Yeah, I agree. I love the flashbacks to Jason's history where he's stealing the Batmobile's wheels and, and showing how, how Jason was a Robin so different than Dick or Tim or, or, you know, any, anybody else that's taken on that, that mantle. He's, has a joy in fighting. He's violent and he's got a wise mouth. He's, you know, mocks the people he's fighting. And there's a great picture of him as Robin. Uh, it's in the, the Batman, uh, 645 page 12 in the middle kind of on the right side of the page he's just it's just you feel the difference in jason as a robin that he was different than any of the other robins and uh, you know he's a different and unique character and they kind of went with that when they transformed him here into red hood which he's you know is to today uh, it's a very very interesting and it really creates a rich bat family kind of legacy he's a great part of it yeah, that's a great point. One of the things that the DVD did a good job of explaining was that uh, how how could anyone steal <laughs> wheels off the Batmobile? But it's explained in the DVD that I guess right. Batman just so happened to recently change something and he didn't ha- have uh, the uh, proper nuts installed just at that time. And this kid, of all time of all times, he happened to notice this, and that's why it was taken. So I, I grant the DVD a uh, good job for the storytelling o- elements with this. One of the things that I enjoyed, too, was I like I like the uh, appearances of uh, some uh, B- B-lister, D-lister villains, yes. and we did have a few sheriffs here. You know, we had the uh, appearance of the hyena, which was their uh, Captain Nazi of all people <laughs> that showed up, <laughs> which was really really strange. Uh, the Captain Boomerang, I think, appeared in a sequence as well. Now in the DVD, I think it was the Riddler in a similar sequence in a flashback, but. Those were some nice nods and just this odd lot of character. And there was a great humorous exchange between uh, Deathstroke and uh, Black Mask Mm -hmm. questioning, you know, which version it was and (laughs) if it was the male or female. And it was just just so so spot on and so deadpan and almost just mocking, you know, just how complicated. The DC history can be at times too. I thought that was a really well done touch by Winnick there, and how that was depicted. I totally agree. And the uh, the Red Hood black mask fight. You know, I know we talked about fights a little while ago, uh, but you know, this is one of the things that I have a, a question about the story. Where you know, we see that who we think is Red Hood has been killed, has been stabbed with a knife, but uh, the, when the when the hood comes off, it's not it's not. Jason, it's some old guy, old ball guy with a mustache, and I'm not really sure if that's a. I don't know when that happened. When did the body switch? Jerry, I'm glad you brought that up because that was a part I was totally lost with as well. It appeared that somehow, some way, Jason. 
Jason had manipulated somebody to impersonate and even fight to a degree in this battle. Then all of a sudden we reveal that there's the reveal that it's not who we think it is. I was lost there. And as great as the story arc as this was, this was a real confusing element of it. Not so much that it, it totally took me out of the story, but it was really, it was, it, it certainly put a brief stop sign there and go, what? what? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just go, just, but uh, it was, and it wasn't, it wasn't one of those, what, where you just go with it, it was sort of a, what, how did this happen? Yeah. yeah. You know, and not so much that it totally took me out, but it took me out for a little bit. So I, that was confusing. I, I guess you had that too. Okay, definitely, definitely. It's it's good when we uh, when it's, we're not crazy. We didn't miss something. I yes, don't think maybe no. maybe some folks out that are listening to this uh, know uh, picked up something that w- that we missed. Then please, you know, let us know because that's yeah. A, explain it. I, I'm lost. I was lost about that a little bit there. Now the other thing that uh, I wasn't familiar. I don't really read a lot of Superman. I wasn't sure. So. You know, the whole way that this story ended. So we're kind of in the middle of a fight and uh, we just, you know, it's almost like the narrator takes over and tells us how how Jason survived. And, you know, there's this timeline shift uh, because of Superman breaking out of prison. I'm not a Superman reader, so I'm not really sure where he was breaking out of or the, the whole ending and explanation of this story seemed a little, I don't want to say rushed. Um, it might have been different, like in continuity, as you're reading it in the floppies, you know, because you know that you're just going to come out with the next one. But as a trade, as a sto- uh, kind of a, a compact, unique story, this kind of drifts off at the end into you get the explanation, but it's not really a you know you don't have a beginning, middle, and end to the story, which is a little bit of a weakness. Are, do you know what this whole Superman situation is? I don't, and don't for better or worse. The trade paperback it reprints all the material as it's given here. I don't think this does new readers or readers like us who who are examining this any favors yeah. uh, when when we're giving it to a reviewer offering an opinion on it. Back in the day, I would have appreciated some editorial ship uh, putting like a little asterisk with the editorial note in the in a margin or, or wherever to have that. And I didn't think that was poorly explained. Further. Compelling along the lines of your thought, Batman Annual 25, I think that was the one, concluded with the, the flash forward time step where it's going to jump ahead to the one year later stuff that happened around this time in comics. And, you know, here we go again. You know, do I have, should I seek this out? You know, I think this really leaves the reader of the trade paperback perplexed as to where the resolution of the story happened. Right. The DVD, again, I, I'm going back to it, did a much better job of explaining every little nuance and detail, in my opinion, to the viewer's satisfaction. They said it wasn't so much any element of the Superman timeline coming in, but rather a Ra's al Ghul mechanization mm-hmm. plan for revenge. He hatched the plot to break out Joker. He hatched the plot to... Uh, have him go after Tim. What Raish didn't know was just the insanity level of the Joker and how unpredictable he was. He was killed, and then he plotted to uh, bring this character back, and as a penance, Raish was going to cease any direct assault or plans directly versus Batman. And I thought that was really played out well. And in a sensitive manner that you see in the DVD is just this Raish almost apologizing to Batman for, for for this and just seeing some sensitivity that you don't really see out of this would-be World Conqueror before yeah. that I think was an element that wasn't quite there or quite hit the nail on the head in the comic book. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. So what would you think about, in terms of you know how you would rate this, whether you think that somebody should read it, what would you think? Jerry, I think this is a story seeped with such Batman lore and history, I would have to fall it into the must-read category. That's what we kind of examine when we look at these trade paperbacks. Is it a must-read, or is it not necessarily a must-read? This would fall into the must-read category. Then we go into our score. How do we get this between a 0 out of 5? Uh, I'm going to have to go with a 4. This mm-hmm. this really had a lot of great stuff here. For me, it was a little longer of a read than you. Mm-hmm. I did have some problems that took me out of the story, but not as so much as where I would criticize it over the whole right. that I, I would totally wave a lot of red flags here. There were little bits of 
criticisms that I had, but not so much that it would affect the overall story. So I'm going to give it a solid four out of five. How about you? Yeah, I agree. We're going to be on the same uh, level here. I'm going to give it a four out of five as well. I thought it was... um, and again, it's an absolute must read because, you know, it, it reintroduces Jason, uh, as the Red Hood, who's very important in current, uh, storytelling and a, a great really reimagines him as a really unique and important character in, uh, the Batman Bat family. So I, th- like you said, there are a couple of quibbles. The ending kind of wanders off in a couple of different ways. There are a couple of plot points that are a little confusing. But in terms of just uh, a lot of fun, and I think that's what it is for me, This there was a lot of fun in this read. So I would definitely recommend it. Give it a must read at four Batarangs. Excellent, excellent. That's good. Jerry, before I forget, you know, one thing I'm really not too good at is remembering to give all the proper shout outs and the likes and tweets and comments that we have on our podcast. So before I forget, I do want to give a shout out in particular to a chap by the name of Darren Murphy, <laughs> who's on Twitter at Murphman or blog. Now he tweeted in particular that he'll be listening to this podcast intently as he's a huge Jason Todd Red Hood fan. So I hope we did this episode justice. I hope we did a great examination and I'm curious as to what his thoughts would be on that. So thank you very much. When someone says that they're looking forward to a show, I can't think of uh, too many much higher praise or compliment that someone would give me as an amateur podcaster doing that. So thank you very much, Darren. We also heard from Reggie Reggie, Paul Shanley, of course, the Sutherlands who do fine, fine, Podcasts at Warlord Worlds, Trucker Talk, and Xenozoic Xenophiles. Thank you very much, gang. Randall Andrews, Banana Jesus, John at Mr. J, Coffee and Comics Blog at Coffee and Comics Blog. Thank you very much, Clinton. The Tim Drake Podcast, Mark at I'm the Gun, Jeff Hunter, Adam Stabelli, Adil Syed, Chris Sheehan over at Ace Comics. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Chris. And of course, hey, the Batman Universe. So thank you very <laughs> much, gang. If we missed you somehow, please let us know and we'll be sure to give you a mention on our next show. That's great. So now, uh, Reggie Reggie, who, along with Chris Sheehan, uh, who's at Ace Comics, they both do this Cosmic Treadmill podcast, which is a terrific, uh, podcast. We just finished, uh, listening to their coverage of, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, which was a terrific, uh, uh, review of that book. It was a five episode, quite, quite an interesting, uh, uh, experience. But Reggie, uh, happened to men- made a mention of something that happened in our past story, the, the Rachel Ghoul story, uh, when, uh, in a past episode we reviewed this. And, uh, we were wondering in that story that, uh, the Lazarus pits, it, the people were coming back to life. Uh, Batman had destroyed all the Lazarus pits and people, uh, weren't able to die. Not only people, animals. No, there was no death on earth. Reggie pointed out that he seems to remember that if all the Lazarus pits are destroyed, then nothing on earth can die. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, we really appreciate that shout out, that little piece of uh, information. Thank you, Reggie. And uh, if anybody else has any more information, we can go and look, look more deeply into that. We'd appreciate it. So thank you very much. That's great. Yeah, I really that's I like when someone can point something out because my memory is certainly not as good as it used to be. But boy, you know, when somebody can point that out, it's it's a nice little tidbit of trivia. So I thank you very much for that. Yeah, I'm not sure if my memory is what it used to be. I I can't recall. (laughs) Uh, Now, Chris, you are out on Twitter. You are at BTO and Bat Books. Yes, thank you very much, Jerry. That's my Twitter handle. And over on that Twitter feed, you can find me uh, doing some uh, shout-outs to uh, some old comic books of yours. Sometimes I'll do something for Saturday morning while I'll give a Saturday morning cartoon a salute. I love that. Uh, yeah, I'll just look at some things or some random thoughts that might pop in my head. I, I have to confess I am a bit nostalgic, maybe too much so. But it seems to resonate with some of the group out there that, that I follow and that follow me. And I really appreciate that. So... If, if that's sort of your thing, by all means, look at it. I hope you give it a follow. I, it's just what goes through my head sometimes. I don't know what to say. You know, I love it. 
I love it too. So thank you so much. Now, Jerry, I think people can find you on Twitter as well. And your handle on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken, is at Professor Frenzy. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. I'm at Professor Frenzy and I, I do uh, 140 character reviews of comic books uh, on a weekly basis. I cover my favorite DC book, DC books. I do some indie books that I like. I do uh, dark shadows sometimes. I uh, also, Chris and I both live tweet horror movies on Saturday nights. Uh, at hashtag Svengoolie. So if you're on Twitter and if you like old horror movies with some crazy corny uh, uh, songs and commentary about the movie, definitely check it out. Uh, it's on uh, MeTV, whatever you get that as a station. And go on to Twitter at hashtag Svengoolie and hang out with the gang. You join Chris and uh, we have a great and it's, time. It's been a lot of fun and it's certainly a welcoming community. Made a lot of connections there and it, very, very friendly, very friendly. There's great atmosphere and good times to be had. And boy, I tell you, some people are so on the fly with being, just having that rapier wit at the moment, <laughs> right so moment to funny. tell that joke. And sometimes a little five seconds behind, you know, like, I go, oh, it's too late, dog. No, I can't tweet. You know, that ship has sailed by the That's time you right. think of the brilliant one liner or what have you. And it's just, sometimes your Twitter's just a little slow on the uptake. And then, yeah. uh, you know, Not but I, I've been, yeah, you know, but a lot of people know where I was going with my sometimes one liner joke and they'll still give me a little like on the <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That, that means so much to me. But Jerry, you're, you're quick on well, my goodness sakes. Uh, you. So I, I admire your I admire your tweets on Saturday nights. Oh, so thank fun. you. Now you know Clinton Robeson of the Coffee and Comics podcast. He's joined us too. So uh, you know anybody that's interested in this, come out. It's a great time. It's a lot of fun. It is, and I know we're kind of skipping around a little bit, but I can't let Jerry go without giving him a shout out for all the nice print reviews he does over on the oh, Batman Universe. You. So if you really want to see a great written review please go over to the Batman universe where you can see Jerry Green write some excellent reviews. And you can see a lot of great written reviews on a lot of yeah. other things, but I, Jerry does a really good job. Jerry has reviewed mother panic mm-hmm. and Jerry, aside from that, you just picked up a recent title yeah. if I'm not mistaken. That's right. I picked up uh, Batgirl and birds of prey and it's a book that I'm really, I'm, I, I picked it up at the beginning of, uh, of rebirth and I, I got it for a few issues and kind of, uh, kind of went uh dropped it for a little while and i heard some really good things about it and i picked it up again and boy has it improved i really am enjoying that book and now i've uh, got the opportunity to review it so uh that's that's working out really well and speaking of bad girl you can also find me on another podcast that's that right. stella's podcast bad girl the oracle where she examines the bad girl title bad girl Storville, and looking at the barbara corn bad girl character and all its various incarnations through there I can be found on that podcast. I yes. was prior reviewing the Batman 66 title, but now that's gone by the wayside. I still will have a segment on that show when that episode released. I, you will hear something new. I am going to cover, I am going to take over, I am going to do a, an examination of a particular uh, title that I think has been overlooked in Batman lore. So that will be revealed forthcoming. So Very we'll give mysterious. It a listen. Thank you. Yes. I look forward to that. I, I heard your last, uh, your last, bit on the podcast you were talking about the um the newspaper strips that was really interesting yeah i gotta really give a shout out to the idw uh publishing company because they do a great job with the comic strip reproductions not just with batman but they do uh the dick tracy strip they've oh, also boy. do the amazing spider-man strip that was from uh the that started in around 1977 with stanley and john romita that was really good stuff but they they're keeping on going, you know, so now I think they're into the uh, uh, Frankita and soon they'll get to the Larry Lieber stuff, which I don't think has been reprinted in any form. Wow. I could be wrong. I know, you know, Comic Shop News has basically taken over the, the current stuff, but I don't think anyone's reprinted any of this particular time period before in another volume. I could be mistaken. I know Comics Review did some for a while, but I don't know if it was totally sequential or not. So, but they do a great job with their strip reproductions. Yeah. I, I like that you mentioned uh, uh, Dick Tracy. I think that, you know, we get, you know, we, we read a lot of DC, folks read a lot of Marvel. People really forget how great that Dick Tracy, uh, newspaper cartoon was and with, uh, the comic was with all of the unbelievable bad guys. I just thought they had great bad guys. Absolutely. I think this was, uh, a different means of storytelling that I think it's some fans often overlook. And I think that's too bad because seeing the sequential, 
period of stuff. And I think, Jerry, you sort of alluded to it before. This was really ingrained with a lot of uh, the populace back in the day. Not so much yes. now with the advent of uh, computer or what have you, but a lot of people really were vested into the story elements of the daily comic strip, be it yes. Terry and the Pirates, Little Orphan Annie, and like, as you mentioned, Dick Tracy. There were a lot of storylines going on where their uh, title character w- would face some sort of peril or cliffhanger. There'd be some sort of life-altering, perhaps, event, you know, uh, family of uh, births. Uh, I think Gasoline Alley was another strip that was oh, more or less yeah. told in real time, you know, with, with uh, the characters actually aging in the comic oh, strips yeah. and going on like that. Yeah. So, yeah. it's, is, it's is a, Walt from uh, Gasoline Alley, is he still yes. around? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> we got to go yeah. check that out. Yeah. I, I, I miss Clovia and then an old, old Skeezix and everybody. Yeah. Oh, I love those guys. That's one yes. of my favorite comic strips is Gasoline oh, yeah. Alley. Oh, yeah. Good oh, stuff. Definitely. Well, check out. Uh, what, I'm sure you have something exciting coming up to uh, to to Batgirl to Oracle. So everybody, get ready. Chris has got something for you. <laughs> so, Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Now, Bat Books for Beginners is part of the BatmanUniverse.net network and family of podcasts and uh, website. We offer all the Batman-based weekly comic book reviews, news, and some great podcasts, including the flagship comic podcast, Everyone Loves the Drake, Batgirl to Oracle, and so many more. If you like what we offer, please consider donating to us at the TBU Patreon account. You can find a link to our Patreon account on the BatmanUniverse.net website. So I think, Chris, that's all we have for today. Please join us in two weeks where Chris and I will be covering another exciting Bat book. So thank you for listening. And my name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And thank you for listening to Bat Books for Beginners. When I read all my comics and I want to go out and buy And I look at the rack and I cannot decide Will I get R.I.P. or Nightwing's Last Stands? Yeah! There's a podcast to get you straight, you Jerry and Chris will never betray you be straight no matter the prices get more games or identity crisis oh, look out bad books for beginners bad books for beginners bad books for beginners welcome to bad books for beginners it's a little old place where we can talk some batman sit back get comfortable Take your relaxant of choice and enjoy the trip. A uh, ride. <laughs> you know. Welcome to Bat Books for Beginners. Here are Jerry and Chris. Bat Books for Beginners. Bat Books for Beginners. Bat Books for Beginners. <laughs>